According to our legacy media, Kamala Harris has all the momentum and the momentum is showing up in the polling. So, for example, there's a brand new poll that shows that Kamala Harris, for the very first time, is actually leading Donald Trump on the economy. This is according to Axios. For the first time this election cycle, voters trust the Democratic candidate more than the former President Trump on the economy. According to new polling released by the Financial Times and the University of Michigan, the share of voters who said that they don't trust either Trump or Harris fell by nearly half. Another example of the disappearing double haters. So in other words, the media have done an amazing job of spinning up Kamala Harris as a candidate. Truly an incredible job because she has done nothing so far. And we are now on day, got to update our calendar here. 24 of Kamala Harris not answering a single question. 24 days of Kamala Harris becoming the de facto nominee after defenestrating her former boss. He's still her boss, but he's kind of not alive anymore. And then not taking any questions whatsoever. Zero questions, 24 days. And yet she has zoomed into a polling lead. Now, why is that happening? That is because the media have created an extraordinarily impenetrable echo chamber. An echo chamber that is so strong. It's effectively a cone of silence for the American people. It's Time Magazine. It's like a perfect apotheosis of how the media actually operate. Time Magazine put out a cover of Kamala Harris and it says the reintroduction of Kamala Harris. Now, first of all, does she need a reintroduction? She's been reintroduced for the last 10 years. She was the AG of California. Then she was a senator from California. Then she ran for president. She lost. Then she was the vice president. She failed. And now she's running again. And it's the reintroduction of Kamala Harris. And it's a picture of her in grayscale looking wistfully, but hopefully off into the future. And it says her moment on the cover. Now, this is not just an echo chamber. It's an extraordinarily powerful echo chamber because it turns out that according to Time itself, Kamala refused to engage in an interview with Time Magazine. So Time Magazine puts out that cover of Kamala Harris for a subject who will not deign to speak with them. That is how the media operate. How do the media operate? Well, let's say that Donald Trump makes a policy proposal months ago. And then let's say Kamala Harris steals that policy proposal and just brings it out as her own. Here are two headlines from CBS News about the exact same policy proposal. First, as presented by President Trump. Second, as presented by Kamala Harris. Here's the headline from CBS News from June 14th. Quote, former President Donald Trump's vow to stop taxing tips would cost the federal government up to $250 billion over 10 years, according to a nonpartisan watchdog group. Fast forward to August 12th. She makes the exact same policy prescription. No taxes on tips. Quote, Vice President Kamala Harris is rolling out a new policy position saying she will fight to end taxes on tips for service and hospitality workers. Did you notice the difference? Could Could you notice that right there? Again, Time Magazine will put out a cover of Donald Trump as an orange ball melting and Kamala Harris as a hopeful face looking into the future without ever speaking with Kamala Harris and in fact making excuses for Kamala Harris. All of this, of course, does generate some real momentum because the media does have a relationship with reality. They generate a fake reality that many people then buy into. So it's not a huge shock that you are seeing Kamala Harris pulling into a swing state lead. And she's pulled into a swing state lead in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in Michigan, according to multiple polls at this point. And all of this is reliant on the continued spin of the media and her continued silence. Because if she ever has to emerge, from the bubble that has been created around her, she will immediately meet with reality and begin to melt. That's what's going to happen right here. That can only happen in a couple ways, however. It can only happen, one, if the media decides to get honest and do their job, not going to happen. Or two, if there is so much outside pressure on Kamala Harris to actually come out of the bubble that she has to. And then she meets with reality and it is very bad for her. And so what the media are now attempting to do is protect not just Kamala Harris, but the bubble they have built around her. They can't just protect Harris. They have to protect the bubble. They are the bubble, you understand. So they're really protecting themselves. Well, the biggest threat to the bubble is the possibility of a competitor arising who might, in fact, penetrate human minds to the same extent they do by going around them. And you've seen this for years. There's really nothing new happening under the sun. Since 2016, when Donald Trump won, there has been an overt effort by regulatory agencies in Europe, by Democrats in the United States, by organizations like the Global Alliance for Responsible Media to shut down alternative sources of information by depriving them of revenue, by declaring them misinformation or disinformation, by telling social media they have to siphon off traffic from anything that is not the legacy media. The bubble must be maintained because if the media lose that bubble, they lose everything. 
They don't just lose their business. They lose their political influence as well. Well, yesterday, all their guns turned on Elon Musk and X. Now, the real reason they were mad at Elon for buying X in the first place was, of course, Twitter was part of their Praetorian Guard. Twitter was part of the team. Twitter was run by Jack Dorsey, a place where you could be banned like Jordan Peterson was for mentioning that boys are not girls. Twitter was a place where if you took heterodox political positions, Twitter would make moves to shut down your distribution and reach. They would shadow ban you. It happened to me. It happened to many others. Well, Twitter was run by Jack Dorsey. Elon bought it. He opened it up. He made clear to everyone what Twitter was doing. And that's what the media could not stand. And ever since that day, they've been scared of Elon. And they've been scared of anybody who is willing to provide a counter to that bubble. Well, yesterday that broke all out into the open because Donald Trump came back on Twitter. He started tweeting again to his own financial non-benefit, by the way, because he runs a rival service called Truth Social, which has pretty much no users except for Donald Trump. It's sort of a meme stock at this point. But regardless, he comes back on Twitter and he does so in advance of a big meet with Elon Musk on Twitter spaces, on X spaces. Donald Trump back on Twitter in expectation of a big Twitter spaces with Elon Musk last night. Tons of people listen. Listen, everything is volatile and chaotic right now. Security is top of mind for many Americans during these crazy times. Security for the country, security for our leaders, security for our families. But you're not financially secure if all your eggs are in one basket. Consider diversifying at least some of your savings today with the help of Birch Gold Group. Gold and silver are an excellent way to diversify your savings. They're a hedge against inflation, a physical asset that's in high demand globally. Through my friends at Birch Gold Group, you can own physical gold and silver in a tax shelter retirement account. That is correct. You can diversify an old IRA or 401k for no money out of pocket into an IRA in gold and silver. There's just one thing you can do today to secure your family's savings. Text Ben to 989898. Receive a free no obligation info kit to learn the role that precious metals play in your overall savings strategy. Again, text Ben to 989898. With an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, thousands of happy customers, you can trust Birch Gold to help diversify your savings and secure your family's financial future. Text Ben to 989898 today. Honestly, with all the cast going on in the world, diversification is just a smart strategy for you, for your family. Go check out Birch Gold right now by texting Ben to 989898 right now. Now, that X Spaces is going to be seen by a couple hundred million people. It went for a couple of hours. It was very lengthy. It was an in-depth conversation between Elon Musk and Trump. Obviously, Elon is a Trump supporter at this point. He has come out and said that he's voting for Donald Trump. He has pledged money to PACs associated with Donald Trump. He wants Trump to win. So it's not like Trump was walking into a super unfriendly space. But Kamala Harris won't even walk into a friendly space because that's how incompetent she is. Donald Trump can speak for two hours on these subjects. You may not like him, you may not agree with him, but he can speak to these subjects without doing serious damage to himself. Everyone understands that if Kamala Harris gets off the teleprompter for 37 seconds at a time, she's screwed. And so the entire bubble, the entire media Democrat apparatus, the human centipede that is Democratic politicians and their press offices and the media, that entire apparatus is threatened by things like what happened last night between Elon Musk and Donald Trump, which is the only way to explain why they went off their rocker. Now, in a normal scenario, you, they, they might say, OK, well, fine. So he did an interview. Who cares? That's not what they did. They called out the big guns. They started freaking out. And I'm not just talking about Democrats. I'm talking about members of the media, regulators in Europe. This could not be. It threatened the informational monopoly that they have created over the course of decades that, that can't be threatened by Elon. And they're going to come after him. So in advance of the interview yesterday, Thierry Breton, who is a European commissioner for the European Commission, a member of the commission, he wrote a letter to Musk in advance of the interview saying, quote, Dear Mr. Musk, I'm writing to you in the context of recent events in the United Kingdom and in relation to the planned broadcast on your platform X of a live conversation between a U.S. presidential candidate and yourself, which will also be accessible to users in the EU. I understand that you are currently doing a stress test of the platform. In this context, I'm compelled to remind you of the due diligence obligations set out in the Digital Services Act, as outlined in my prior letter. As the individual entity ultimately controlling a platform with over 300 million users worldwide, of which one third are in the EU, that has been designated as a very large online platform, you have a legal obligation to ensure excess compliance with EU law and in particular, the Digital Services Act in the EU. This notably means ensuring, on one hand, that freedom of expression and of information, including media freedom and pluralism, are effectively protected. And on the other hand, and this is the hand that, that they're all really concerned with, that all proportionate and effective mitigation measures are put in place regarding the amplification of harmful content in connection with relevant events, including live streaming, 
which, if unaddressed, might increase the risk profile of X and generate detrimental effects on civic discourse and public security. This is important against the background of recent events of public unrest brought about by the amplification of content that promotes hatred, disorder, incitement to violence, or certain instances of disinformation. It also implies informing EU judicial and administrative authorities without undue delay on the measures taken to address their orders against content considered illegal, according to national and or EU law, taking timely, diligent, non-arbitrary and objective action upon receipt of notices by users considering certain content illegal, informing users concerning the measures taken upon receipt of the relevant notice and publicly reporting about content moderation measures. In this respect, I note the DSA obligations apply without exceptions or discrimination to the moderation of the whole user community and content of X, which is accessible to EU users and should be fulfilled in line with the risk-based approach of the DSA. And then he threatens, right? As you know, formal proceedings are already ongoing against X under the DSA. We cannot exclude potential spillovers in the EU, so we are monitoring the potential risks in the EU associated with the dissemination of content that may incite violence, hate, and racism in conjunction with major political or societal events around the world, including debates and interviews in the context of elections. And he concludes, My services and I will be extremely vigilant to any evidence that points to breaches of the DSA and will not hesitate to make full use of our toolbox, including by adopting interim measures should it be warranted to protect EU citizens from serious harm. Okay, so that is a lot of talk for a pretty short message, which is shut the hell up or we are going to come after a company and destroy you. That's the European commissioner in advance of the Elon Musk, Donald Trump interview. That's how threatened they are. That's how scared they are of the possibility that the legacy media, Apple cart gets upset. It's totally insane. So President Trump's campaign put out a statement in response to all of this. Yaccarino, Linda Yaccarino, who runs the ad services at X, she replied in a tweet, quote, denouncing Breton's unprecedented attempt to stretch a law intended to apply in Europe to political activities in the United States, because that's what he's doing. This person is not just saying that you can't have an interview with, say, Nigel Farage in the UK, which would be bad enough. I mean, talk about violations of free speech principles. But the EU is saying Elon Musk, an American citizen, cannot have a conversation with President Trump, a former president of the United States, on X for fear that it might trigger EU laws. She said, it also patronizes European citizens, suggesting they are incapable of listening to a conversation and drawing their own conclusions. Elon Musk was uh, more himself. He replied with a meme from the movie Tropic Thunder uh, of, of Tom Cruise uh, as, as a Hollywood super agent saying, take a big step back and literally F your own face, which is <laughs> the most Elon thing ever. The Trump campaign issued the following statement, quote, the European Union should mind their own business instead of trying to meddle in the U.S. presidential election. Only in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's America can an undemocratic foreign organization feel emboldened enough to tell this country what to do. They know a President Trump victory means America will no longer be ripped off because he will smartly utilize tariffs and renegotiated trade deals that put America first. Let's be very clear. The EU is an enemy of free speech and has no authority of any kind to dictate how we campaign. But here's the thing. It is not just the Europeans. So, of course, it's the Europeans. Of course, but it's not just the Europeans. It's the American media. Apparently, only the media and the press get to reap the benefits of free speech. That is the only way that this works. Doesn't sound super American. You know, it is American. American financing. Everything is more expensive these days. Americans are struggling to make ends meet. By the time you pay the bills, fill up your car, go grocery shopping, there's almost nothing left. You're laying out your credit card for all non-essentials, maybe even some essentials. Well, last I checked, the average credit card interest rate for Americans is now sitting at 22% which is crazy. If you own a home, how are you supposed to dig yourself out of all that debt? Well, here's the answer. Call my friends over at American Financing right now. They're helping people just like you turn things around by using the equity in their home to pay off that high interest debt. They understand what you're going through. They talk to people in your position every day. American Financing is saving their borrowers an average of 854 bucks a month. It's like a $10,000 raise. They're closing some in as little as 10 days. If you start today, you might not have to make next month's mortgage payment. Turn your situation around. Call American Financing today. Call American Financing right now. Start your journey toward being credit card debt free. Their number is 866-721-3300. That's 866-721-3300. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net, NMLS 182-334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. And one of the great astonishing things about the American media is that no one clamors more loudly about the importance of the First Amendment. The First Amendment. But you have to understand, before American media, the First Amendment only applies to them. When they see freedom of the press being protected, they do not see freedom of the press as a subsection of an amendment dealing more broadly with freedom of speech. They see themselves as a special elite who have been elected by the fates 
in order to express free speech. You don't get to, but they are members of the press. They're members of the press. And that means that they have exorbitant and magical abilities to engage in free speech. But you don't. Elon Musk doesn't. President Trump doesn't because you are not members of the press. You have not been stamped from above with the journalism or label. And thus, free speech does not really apply to you. That is the only way to explain the massive double think that they apply when it comes to the free speech rights of others. So, for example, the Washington Post ran a news piece yesterday titled, quote, Elon Musk's X feed becomes megaphone for his far right politics. And the entire article is just about how Elon Musk is right wing and that's bad and he's far right and misinformation and disinformation and blah, 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 blah. Why are they so concerned about that? Obviously, Elon is an important person in American public life, but I've never seen them suggest that anyone on the left is a font of misinformation and disinformation. Quote, if you follow Elon Musk on Twitter in November 2021, you would have been bombarded with posts about Tesla and SpaceX, his two most valuable companies. Nearly three years later, with Musk at the helm of the site he renamed X, the billionaire's feed often reads more like right-wing activist account with alarmist posts about immigration and missives against woke ideology. Musk's openly partisan participation on the site he bought in October 2022 reflects a broader evolution in his public persona, from business-minded tech prodigy to right-wing firebrand. It has also raised questions about Musk's intentions for the social networking site, which he said he purchased to promote free speech and a more open exchange of ideas. In some ways, the site has become a personal megaphone for his provocative political views. Okay, first of all, that is a lie, given the fact that Joe Biden announced that he wouldn't be running for president again on X via a PDF letter. So it is, in fact, the town square. Second of all, the Washington Post is owned by, wait for it, wait for it, Jeff Bezos. And so if the idea here is that billionaires don't get to play in the journalistic sandbox or in the free speech sandbox, I have some bad news for the Washington Post. Honestly, these journalists take this to the ultimate extreme. So here, for example, is a Washington Post pseudo journalist. His name is Cleve Woodson. He's in the White House press room. And he literally asks the White House about why Elon Musk is allowed to interview Donald Trump and about misinformation and disinformation. Now, this is truly Orwellian stuff. Here you have a journalist for the Washington Post owned by rival billionaire Jeff Bezos, who also happens to own a giant space company. And... He is asking this journalist, the White House, if they can please help shut down alternative viewpoints. Remember, the First Amendment only applies to the specials. It doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to other people across the broad aisle. Here is Cleve Woodson Jr. of the Washington Post to Corrine Jean-Pierre and listen to her answer. Elon Musk is slated to interview Donald Trump tomorrow, tonight um, on, on X. Uh, I don't know if the president is going to tonight. Feel free to say if he is or not. Um, but I... I think that um, misinformation on Twitter is not just a campaign issue. It's a, you know, it's an America issue. Uh, What role does the White House uh, or the president have in sort of stopping that or stopping the spread of that or um, sort of intervening in that? Some of that was about campaign misinformation, but, you know, it's a wider thing, right? Yeah, no, and you've heard us talk about this many times from here, about the responsibilities that social media uh, platforms have uh, when it comes to misinformation, disinformation. Uh, Don't have anything to read out from here about uh, specific ways uh, that we're working on it, but we believe that, that they have the responsibility. Uh, These are private companies, so we're also mindful of that, too. Uh, But... um, Look, it is. Uh, I think it, it is incredibly important uh, to to call that out as you are you're doing. I just don't have any specifics on on what we have been doing internally. My goodness, have you ever seen better evidence of the Democrat media human centipede than what just happened right there? The media rebelling against free speech, rebelling against Elon Musk interviewing Donald Trump on a space he owns. Remember, he owns that space, and here you have a supposed First Amendment enjoying advocate like Cleve Woodson, who no one's ever heard of until this moment, from the Washington Post, declaring that the White House should maybe do something about it. Can you do something about it? Can you please do something about it? And the entire media are in the bag on this thing. Why? Because it's not just that they have to protect Kamala Harris. It's about something much bigger than Kamala Harris. The entire apparatus of informational dissemination that they have built, that human centipede, it must be maintained at all costs. It provides a bubble in which left-wing messages can always be protected, in which the American people will never hear the downsides, in which you can have a candidate who does not speak to anyone for 24 days and no one seems to give a bleep. That can only be maintained with informational monopoly. And again, it's not just Cleve Woodson. I don't want to call him out as the only person who is like this. 
It is, for example, Sarah Fisher from Axios, who says the big problem is that Musk is going to let Trump spread disinformation. Why? I mean, it might be terrible. You know, it might be absolutely terrible if you had entire networks like, say, CNN or entire websites like, say, Axios that just take stenography from the Biden administration. And they were just, you know, echo chambers for an entire political view. That would be quite terrible. That would be just awful. You would never want a friendly interviewer, for example, to sit with a presidential candidate for two hours. That would be that would be quite awful. Not that it's ever happened with, you know, the media and Democrats or anything. Not that that's their entire business model. Here is Sarah Fisher. Because Elon Musk has come out and endorsed Donald Trump, I expect this to be like a bromance type of an interview where they're supporting each other. I think that Elon Musk will let Donald Trump speak all the falsehoods and misinformation that he wants. I mean, he's not a journalist. It's not his job necessarily. Does he want to be fact checking all of the information? So I think it's just a platform for Donald Trump to come out and say whatever he wants. But the thing to remember, Cassie, is like the interview audience here is what Donald Trump needs. You see J.D. Vance going on Face the Nation, right? Sunday shows, traditional media, because he needs to get his name out there. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump's going the opposite route, right? He's talking to streamers and podcasters. He's going on X. He wants to rally up that sort of fringe online base. That's what Donald Trump is doing here tonight. Okay, so again, it's just misinformation, disinformation. Oh my gosh. And that would never happen on CNN. You would never have all of the networks in unison, screaming to the heavens orgasmically about the magic of Kamala Harris or anything. They, you, you would never have all of the legacy media mobilizing in her favor to lie about her record and allow her to lie about her record, and then mobilizing in counterformation in order to stop the dissemination of any countervailing information. You'd never see that at all. Here's CNN's Casey Hunt doing the same routine. Musk's rise as a Trump backer comes as X has turned into a haven for the spread of misinformation. Since buying the site almost two years ago, Musk's site has struggled to control it on topics ranging from the election to the assassination attempt against Trump. Sometimes the bad information has been boosted by Musk himself, who posted a conspiracy regarding the attack on Paul Pelosi in October of 2022 before deleting it. How's that Covington Catholic lawsuit coming over there, CNN? How that whole Russiagate thing that you did for like four years for ratings? How's that, how's that working out? For you? How about the Joe Biden is perfectly healthy routine that you guys were running for several years over there? I'll bet you CNN isn't losing any sleep about all the stories they have botched, but I'm losing sleep all the time or would be if it were not for my Helix Sleep mattress. My days are incredibly full between the show, being a dad, various other responsibilities. Can't keep up with the day if I don't get a good night's sleep. That's why I appreciate my Helix mattress. Helix harnesses years of his mattress expertise to offer a truly elevated sleep experience. The Helix Elite collection includes six different mattress models, each tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. If you're nervous about buying a mattress online, you really don't have to be. Helix has a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress, because why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? I took the Helix Quiz. I was matched with a firm but breathable mattress, which I love. My wife loves it as well. We are big Helix fans over at Shapiro Stan. Helix has a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will. Helix's financing options, flexible payment plans make it so a great night's sleep is never far away. For a limited time, Helix is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Just go to helixsleep.com slash Ben. That's Helix Sleep. Dot com slash Ben. It's their best offer yet. It will not last long with Helix. Better sleep starts right now. That's helixsleep.com slash Ben for their best offer yet. And the, the amazing projection here, the only we can do it from the legacy media, only we can create a Praetorian garden in favor of our favorite candidate. And anything that breaks the monopoly is bad and must therefore be destroyed. It's amazing. It's amazing. And they're all, I mean, the mask is off for the media. Anybody who has trust in the legacy media at this point, I don't know how to even diagnose you if you have trust in the legacy media's veracity and objectivity at this point. Here's what I want. They're all saying, well, Elon Musk has said that he is a Trump donor. He has said that he is going to back Donald Trump. I want to see how every one of these anchors voted. I want to see who they donated to if they were allowed to donate. That's what I want to see. I want to know their own political bona fides because they're hiding behind the quote unquote mask of objectivity while simply doing Kamala Harris's bidding like a bunch of lapdogs so how about this? If they're going to say that, that Musk is a threat because he's being honest about his own politics, what if they were honest about their own politics for five seconds flat? Again, all of this is designed simply to hide who Kamala Harris is, to hide the fact that she has flipped every single one of her positions, to hide her radicalism and all the rest. Okay, so the Musk-Trump X space begins 
about 40 minutes late. Now, I, I don't know what's going on technically over there. Obviously, they've had these sorts of problems before. They had this with Ron DeSantis' campaign launch when Elon Musk interviewed Ron DeSantis on an X base and it just fritzed out for the first 20 minutes or so. And fritzed out for like 40 minutes last night. Probably that was because there were over a million people who were simultaneously trying to listen to this very, very long conversation. And it was Musk freewheeling and Trump freewheeling. And it was pretty enjoyable. It was very long. You know, for people who love Trump, I'm sure that it you know, sort of reinforced why you love Trump. But beyond that, it also exposed the fact that Donald Trump is willing to talk with anyone at length for two hours, which Kamala Harris will not do. Not even with friendlies. Kamala Harris won't sit down with Casey Hunt for two hours. Kamala Harris will not sit down with even her own donors for two hours and explain her positions because she'll break into the awkward laughter. By the way, recommendation, when Donald Trump actually debates Kamala Harris, he can't just say that she laughs awkwardly. What he should say when he debates Kamala Harris is the truth, which is every time she's caught in a question she doesn't like, her tell is that she laughs awkwardly. And then when she does it, he should say, because she just got caught now not knowing what the hell she's talking about. That's what he should. In any case, I digress. Here was Donald Trump with Elon Musk last night talking about Kamala Harris on immigration. Now she's trying to say she sure. had nothing to do with it. And she's such a liar because she was called the border czar the first day and it was on the headlines of every newspaper. She's the border czar and she never even went there. She went to one location which had nothing to do with where the problem is. You know, she went in and out, right. I guess, because she was getting a lot of pressure, yeah, but yeah. had nothing to do with the problem. Yeah. Is. But she was well, the well, border czar and you, people yeah, can't yeah. allow them to get away with their disinformation campaign. Now she's trying to say that uh, she wasn't uh, she wasn't really involved. And uh, the whole thing is horrible. She was totally in charge. She could have shut the border down without him. He didn't know what he was doing anyway, so he wouldn't have even known yeah. what happened. <laughs> he is right about all of that. He then points out that Kamala Harris is more incompetent than Joe Biden. Again, as I've been saying, and it's pretty much everybody's been saying, Donald Trump's sole responsibility for the rest of this campaign is making the American people get to know Kamala Harris because no one knows who she is. She is a chameleon. She lies about every position she has ever hold, she, she has ever held. She lies about herself routinely. Here was Donald Trump. She had three and a half years. And by the way, they have another five months that they can do something, but they yeah. won't do anything. It's all talk. She's yeah. incompetent and he's incompetent. And frankly, I think that she's more incompetent than he is. And that's saying something because he's not too good. Well, it is a fact that Kamala Harris is not with us, but not in the same way as Joe Biden. Joe Biden may be dead. Kamala Harris is just not all that mentally healthy. Well, that is a fact. The fact is that probably Kamala Harris needs more than just kale smoothies to operate at her best. And we all do. That's why I want to tell you about Momentus. Momentus creatine, omega-3 and protein covers all the bases. These three supplements support nearly every aspect of foundational health, from aiding cognitive function to reducing muscle and joint inflammation. My good friend and colleague, Christine, triathlete, who also happens to be a mom to a toddler, has been taking these three supplements daily. She is thrilled with the results. She's not only kicking butt on her Peloton every morning, she's kicking butt at work as well. This is not just your run-of-the-mill supplement. Momentus works with only the best experts in the business and uses only the highest quality ingredients. What's on the label is what's in the product. Absolutely nothing else. Straight facts, no nonsense. Just how I like it. Momentus also heavily invests in third-party testing, holding their products to the standards set by the most demanding organizations in the world, including the NFL and the NBA. Some of the world's greatest athletes use Momentus and have even helped develop Momentus products. If you want to take supplements that are made by and used by the best in the world, go to livemomentus.com slash Shapiro or use code Shapiro for 20% off. That's livemomentus.com slash Shapiro. Okay, President Trump also went off on the inflationary record of Kamala Harris. Here he was on her handling of the economy. The election's coming up and the people want to hear about the economy and the fact that Absolutely they can't sure. buy groceries because they don't have enough money to buy groceries. The inflation has killed them. Food prices are up 50, 60, even 100 percent in some cases. And this this stupid administration allowed this to happen. And it's a shame he, of course, is correct about that. By the way, now the inflationary stats, apparently the new PPI came in. And what it shows is a year over year, 2.2% increase in the inflation, which is going to be just in time for the Fed to come in and try and rescue the Biden-Harris economy. Isn't that exciting? They're going to come in in the next few weeks, and they are presumably going to lower the interest rates, boost spending, and make everybody feel better just in time for the election. Don't worry. It's all stats. It's all math. It has nothing to do with the politics of the situation. In any case, President Trump went on to attack Kamala Harris and Joe Biden over their Iran record, which, of course, he is correct about, extremely correct about. 
They knew not to mess around. Iran was broke because I told China, if you buy from Iran oil, it's all about the oil. That's where the money is. But if you buy oil from Iran, you're not going to do any business with the United States. And I meant it. And they said, we'll yeah, pass. Yeah. They didn't buy oil. Other countries, likewise, sure. you want to buy, you're not doing business with the United States. And they, they were at a point where they were, they had no money for Hamas. They had no money for Hezbollah. They had no money for any of these instruments of terror. He is right. He is right about all of that. And he also talked about why it was that Putin didn't invade Ukraine. This is probably the most amusing part of the interview. Uh, I, I have a feeling this conversation did not go word for word exactly how President Trump relates it, but uh, it, is, it is funnier the way he tells it. I said to Vladimir Putin, I said, don't do it. You can't do it, Vladimir. You do it. It's going to be a bad day. You cannot do it. And I told him things that what I do. And he said, no way. And I said, way. And, you know, it's the last time we ever had the conversation. <laughs> I hope that's how the conversation went. Vladimir Putin was sitting there. He goes, no way, Mr. President. He said, way. <laughs> I hope that's how it went. Then President Trump also went off on the energy record of Biden-Harris, pointing out that they have been radically anti-fracking. By the way, the, the, the fracking transformation of the energy industry in the, of the United States has not only transformed the economy of the United States, it's transformed the entire geopolitics of the, of the planet because it meant that OPEC was no longer ruling the roost economically. Here's President Trump talking about it. The gasoline, Elon, is the, the, the cost of energy. Not only gasoline, it's the cost of heating your house and cooling your house. That has sure. to come down. It, it's gone up 100%, 150 and 200%. And that has to come down. When that comes down, and we're going to yeah. drill, baby, drill. You know, they stopped drilling, and then they went back to drilling because they went, went back to the Trump policy. He's right again about that. Finally, the one headline, media were looking for some sort of policy headline to take away. And so the policy headline they took away was that President Trump said that we should do away with the Department of Education and we should move education back to the state, which is, which is obviously true. The Department of Education is a large-scale waste of money. It is basically there to please Randy Weingarten and her friends over at the American Federation of Teachers. Here, uh, here he was. What I'm going to do, one of the first acts, and this is where I, I need an Elon Musk. I need somebody that has a lot of strength and courage and smarts. I want to close up Department of Education, move education back to the states, where, yeah. where, where states like Iowa, where states like Idaho, you know, not every state will do great because states that basically aren't doing good now. You look at uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. He uh, he's terrible. He does a terrible job. So he's not going to do great with education. OK, well, he's right about all that. Finally, Elon responds to all of this. He commends Donald Trump on his bravery. He actually opened the interview by commending Donald Trump on his bravery when he was shot in the ear. Well, what I find admirable there was that you, you can't fake bravery under such circumstances. The courage is instinctual or it is not. It's not a rehearsed action. And so I just want to say that uh, I think a lot of people admire your, your, your courage under fire there. Elon also lent his way to the campaign, suggesting that he would join President Trump in doing a, a government efficiency commission to look into the efficiency of government. I think it would be great to just have a government efficiency commission that takes a look at, uh, at, at these things and, and just ensures that the taxpayer money, the, to the taxpayer's hard-earned money is spent in a good way. Um, and and, I, and I'd, I'd be happy to help out on such a commission I'd if, love it. if it were formed. Okay, and, um, and finally, he suggested correctly that President Trump has to win for the good of the country. He says, listen, Everyone is trying to paint me as some sort of rabid right winger. He said, I, I stood in line for six hours to meet Barack Obama at one point. I voted Democrat many times. The country has moved in a different direction because Democrats have governed poorly. I think we're in massive trouble, uh, frankly, with, with the Kamala administration. And that's my honest opinion. Um, and uh, and I, I think uh, I think really it's essential that, that uh, you win for the good of the country. Uh, for this election. And I mean, that's understating my opinion. Okay, that right there, that is the reason they hate Elon. It's because he's being open about what he thinks. And it is because he's offering a platform to President Trump. Remember, Twitter literally kicked Donald Trump off the platform. And now X is back and Donald Trump is being featured by the owner of X on the platform. That's the thing they hate. They loved the fact that after January 6th, 
Donald Trump was summarily booted from all major social media. They loved it. It was their favorite thing. What they hate is when the monopoly is threatened. Because when the monopoly is threatened, it might force them to defend themselves. It might force their favorite candidates to defend themselves. And they have this lukewarm, urine-filled kiddie pool that they have been bathing in for the last several decades. They do not like when somebody upsets the apple cart. They really don't like it at all. And Elon has done that. So have all sorts of other insurgent media, and they cannot handle it. We will get to what exactly they are protecting. The answer, of course, is Kamala Harris's lies and more lies and more lies. First, the same white guys that absolutely demolished the left's gender ideology with what is a woman, they're back. They're taking on an even bigger target. Get ready for Am I Racist? It hits theater September 13th. Our very own Matt Walsh went undercover as a so-called DEI expert. Let me tell you, the level of absurdity he uncovered, and it's pretty wild. You think you know how ridiculous this stuff gets? You haven't seen anything yet. Now, here's the deal. We need your help to get this film into theaters nationwide. Pre-sale tickets drop this Thursday. It's absolutely crucial you buy them. Why? Because the more tickets we sell now, the more theaters will show it. This is how we fight back against the left's stranglehold on culture. Every ticket sale is a blow against their narrative. When we fight, we win, period. Pre-sales start Thursday at miracist.com. Go check it out right now. Well, what exactly are Democrats protecting? And what are the media protecting? Well, the biggest thing right now that they are protecting is Kamala Harris. It's the reason why they could for years pretend that Joe Biden was sentient. And then at the drop of a hat, when he exposed himself, they could dump him off the side of a cliff. That, that's how they could do that. Because protect the machine, protect the machine. Well, the Harris campaign sent a crazy email out fundraising after the Musk-Trump interview. Quote, right now, Elon Musk is interviewing Donald Trump live on Twitter. We're not calling it X. Because see, see, see what, what rebels they are? They're not calling it X. It's not enough that Musk has pledged to donate millions of dollars to help re-elect Trump. He's using his purchased platform, one of the largest social media sites in the world, to spread Trump's unhinged and hateful agenda to millions of users. How dare Donald Trump's work? He's the most famous person maybe in the history of Earth at this point. How dare Donald Trump be given a platform to say things, says Kamala Harris. If that's all you need to hear, chip in 25 bucks an hour to help Kamala and Tim have the resources to respond to their lies. Otherwise, let me remind you why this is a big deal. The richest person in the world is a lackey for Team MAGA. Uh, well, I noticed that many of the other richest people in the world are lackeys for Team Kamala and actively intervened in the presidential race by forcing Joe Biden out of the race. I mean, that was clearly stated that the donor class forced Biden out of the race by drying up all of his money. So spare me the crocodile tears here. Musk already ruined Twitter by allowing hate speech and disinformation to flood the platform, says the Harris Walls campaign. Now Musk is using his vast fortune and broad reach to try to control our democracy because nothing says controlling the democracy like allowing people to speak in front of other people. That is control of the democracy. You see, free democracy, true democracy is when we shut down all dissenting points of view, kick them off the platform and then elevate the legacy media to holy writ. That is the that is true democracy. And that's the thing. That's what they actually think. That's what they actually think. They think true democracy can only be effectuated if they control the means of media production. Elon Musk threatens that. And so they don't like it. And of course, they have to they have to maintain this. They have to because this campaign in the absence of the Praetorian Guard is a bleep show. They flipped every single position. So as we mentioned earlier, Kamala Harris trotted out the Donald Trump campaign position. There should be no tax on tips. A smart position for Trump to take, particularly in Nevada, where there's a lot of people who make a living off of tips. So Corinne Jean-Pierre over at the White House was asked about whether Joe Biden supports no tax on tips, considering that Kamala Harris has now said that she supports that policy. And if so, why haven't they tried to effectuate anything like that? And so now they're going to flip in real time and pretend that Joe Biden was always in favor of no tax on tips. He's been president for three and a half years. He's never mentioned the thing at any point. His IRS has been staffed up to go after low-level waiters to grab their taxes on tips. But don't worry, says Corinne Jean-Pierre. Actually, he was always in favor of exempting tips from tax. He was always. It turns out that we were always at war with East Asia. Here we go. Following up on eliminating taxes on tips, is that an idea that the Biden administration considered at any point in the past three and a half years? What I can say is the president supports it. Uh, and uh, what I can say is... Um, Obviously, the president and the vice president, very much what I just how I answered the earlier question is that we have always put at front and center, making it easier, giving American families a little bit more breathing room, something the president says very often. Uh, and so and we've shown that we've shown that in the policies that we've laid out and, you know, not going to go into what the former president said, but, you know, if 
if Republicans truly cared about that, truly cared about hardworking Americans, they would have joined us on a lot of these uh, proposals that we put forward. You're joining Trump on his proposal. And now you're pretending that it was always your proposal. It's amazing. The only way you can get away with this is when you know that the media will defend you no matter what. Okay, then, apparently, Corinne Jean-Pierre went a step further. And this is going to be a problem for Kamala Harris because this should be every campaign ad that Donald Trump runs from here to the election. She says that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are always in sync, that they think the same things, they breathe the same air, they feel the same feelings. It's like E.T. and Elliot. They have a heart connection. He's going to turn her heart light on. Here we go. Here is a, here's Corinne Jean-Pierre. It's safe to say that anything that she would put forward along these lines that also would have the backing of the president. I, I, you can you can say you can you can certainly uh, say or I can say that they are partners in this. So they believe uh, and certainly on the same page uh, when we think about the economy, when we think about health care. Uh, her, they have to work through what their policies ideas are. But the last three and a half years, they've been in sync. Uh, they have been certainly uh, on the same page. And I, I, I presume that that will continue from here. Mm. So they are fully in sync and they have been and they will be. OK, so that means Harris owns everything that Biden did and Biden owns everything Harris does. All righty, then. Flashback, Kamala 2020. She says that she would close detention centers. Remember, she is not an open border. Borders are. She is she's a tough on crime prosecutor and the, the astonishing attempt to swivel Kamala Harris into something she manifestly is not can only be effectuated by a monopolistic media. It's the only way to do it. Here she was in 2020. This is not long ago. Hi, my name is Sally Hartman. I'm a volunteer with the Center for Worker Justice. Okay. I want to know when you become president, would you be committing to close the Immigration detention centers? Absolutely, on day one. She closed the detention centers on day one, she says. Now she's campaigning as a tough on crime prosecutor. It's absolutely astonishing. Peter Ducey asked a, a pretty hilarious question at the White House press conference yesterday. He said, you know, Kamala Harris is now running on a, as, a, as a tough on the border prosecutor. He's saying that she, she is saying that she wants to increase the number of border patrol She's saying that she wants to deport more people. She is now all of a sudden swiveling into a border hawk. So does it feel weird that she's repudiating Biden? And Karine Jean-Pierre's like, what? What now? How long have you guys known that Vice President Harris does not think that President Biden is effective with his border policy? I mean, that, you're, you're making a huge jump. Why, why, she did not say this. This it, is something that you are assuming... I don't understand why you would assume that. It's not true. She has a campaign ad where she is saying they need more Border Patrol agents. If President Biden's doing we're, such a good job, why we, do they need we, any more Border we agents? We might believe that. The President does want more Border Patrol agents. You know who's getting in the way? You know who's getting in the way? Republicans in Congress. They're getting in the way. You know who else is getting in the way? The former President. It's just unbelievable. It's just unreal. Bernie Sanders at least points for honesty. Uh, the, the nice thing about Bernie is that Bernie is not a very bright egg. And so Bernie will just say the quiet part out loud. So here is Bernie Sanders, who is quickly morphing into a Muppet of Bernie Sanders in real time. <laughs> not sure what's going on with Bernie, but I guess he gets older. He just turns into like a Muppet of himself. In any case, he says that um, he, he's asked on CNN. She keeps reversing her positions. And he's like, well, you know, reversals are normal when you are lying so you can become president. Talking about some of the policies that you care most about, she has reserved, reversed herself rather on some like Medicare for all, uh, on some parts of immigration policy, fracking. Does that give you cause for concern? Well, look, she has to run her campaign and I'm sure she is, you know, talking to all kinds of people to come up with an agenda that will uh, lead to victory in November. Oh, she's running her campaign and she has to win. And so she's allowed to lie. Okay, it's all out there right in the open. She's a liar. The media are liars. The Democrats are lying to you. They will lie about her. They will pretend that she's a moderate. They'll pretend she didn't hold positions that she clearly held five seconds ago. They will pretend that she is a border hawk now or that she fought inflation or that she's in favor of a stable Middle East, that she's a moderate all across the spectrum. They will do all of that because they assume you're stupid and they assume that the echo chamber they have created is absolutely impenetrable. And if you ever attempt to penetrate the echo chamber, if you ever attempt to crack the seal on the cone of silence they've created around the American people, they react 
with the rage of the mad. That is what we are seeing over the course of the last 24 hours. It's what we're going to see from here all the way up until the election. Meanwhile, things continue to heat up in the Middle East. Presumably, there's supposed to be some sort of ceasefire summit that happens in Egypt on Thursday. The Biden White House is really trying to broker this thing because they are hoping to forestall some sort of Iranian attack. What the ceasefire negotiation really is about at this point is not the ceasefire. It's really about providing some sort of face-saving measure so that Iran doesn't have to launch an attack large enough that Israel destroys its oil fields and nuclear facilities or so that Hezbollah can climb down from the tree upon which it's been sitting so that they don't have to launch a major attack in retaliation for the death of their number two in Lebanon. So basically, the Biden administration is trying to force the Israelis into some sort of ceasefire deal that allows all of these parties to climb down from the tree and pretend that everything is hunky-dory again and that they got some sort of victory out of Israel conceding something. Meanwhile, Israel's like, listen, we'll make concessions if it's in our interest to make the concessions. Iran continues to mouth off. So there was widespread suggestion that today was going to be the big day for an Iranian or Hezbollah attack on Israel. That apparently has not materialized. Today is Tisha B'Av, which is a big fast day in the Jewish calendar. Pretty much everybody, including me, is fasting right now. No food, no water for 25 hours. It's a, it's a commemoration of the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem, as well as the second temple in Jerusalem. And it's sort of become a catch-all date for human tragedy among the Jewish people. So a lot of mourning of October 7th is happening on Tisha B'Av. There was an expectation that because it, the, the holiday is about the exile of the Jewish people from their historic homeland, that because of that, Iran would take advantage of that and attack because the way that the logic of radical Muslims works, no one can touch them during Ramadan. It's like, it's like putting your hand on the tree while you're playing while you're playing tag. However, if it's a Jewish holiday or a Christian holiday, that, that's actually the best time to attack because obviously those are not the true religions, according to radical Islam. In any case, that was supposed to materialize. It didn't. One of the reasons it didn't is because Iran is deeply fearful of what comes next if they actually go hard. Israel, for its part, according to the Wall Street Journal, put its military on high alert. The Pentagon said it is sending a guided missile submarine to the region and speeding up the arrival of a second aircraft carrier amid heightened concerns about a possible Iranian and Hezbollah response to the killing of militant leaders in Tehran and Beirut. Israel set the high alert level for its military for the first time this month after observing preparations by Iran and Hezbollah. Now, there's some good satellite data showing that Iran is gearing up some sort of rocket fire. One of the big questions is why Israel doesn't preemptively hit it. And the answer is because the Biden administration is telling them not to. As always, Joe Biden and his team at the State Department and Kamala Harris and this entire team are holding the chain because the only thing they care about is the fake peace that prevails in the absence of the victory of our allies. They prefer slow moving disaster to outright victory by our allies. Even the White House is admitting at this point. The U.S. intelligence indicates it's increasingly likely Iran will attack Israel this week. Now, again, what they're hoping is that they can broker some sort of deal that will allow Hezbollah and Iran to claim victory and Hamas to claim victory. Israel, of course, is not going to allow that, especially because Israel now has the military upper hand, not only in the Gaza Strip, but with regard to Iran itself. Hamas, for its part, has been sending some mixed signals a couple of days ago. They rejected all compromise despite the fact that the Biden administration had been putting heavy pressure on Israel and announced a negotiating summit scheduled for Thursday, Hamas came out and said that they weren't going to engage. So now they're trying to put extra pressure on Hamas to engage, which again is incredible. Hamas is basically down to Yahya Sinwar, a few of his buddies holding Israeli women in captivity. That's what the Hamas leadership is down to. It's pathetic. And the United States is trying to save them under Joe Biden in order to forestall some sort of flare up that might require allied intervention to prevent missiles from hitting Israel and starting a more general regional war. Meanwhile, you want to know something about Kamala Harris's campaign? You wonder how anti-Israel they're going to be? Well, we now know. We have two indicators, actually. So first off, we have the indicator that Kamala Harris has now appointed a person named Nasrina Bargzi to deputy counsel for her. She's deputy counsel to Vice President Kamala Harris. This is according to Daniel Greenfield reporting for Front Page Mag. Who is she? Well, after 9-11, she was interviewed by law enforcement over troubling comments on the war on terror reported by her friends. After coming to America from a wealthy family in Kandahar, later a stronghold of the Taliban and al-Qaeda, Nasrina Bargzi was raised in Concord, California, one of the state's hubs for Afghan migrants, and quickly got involved in anti-American and pro-terrorist activism. In 2001, while attending college, she was interrogated by the FBI about comments she'd made to her friends. Then she received a law school scholarship intended for women who had suffered persecution under the Taliban, even though she had left long before they came to power. She became a legal fellow at the ACLU 
and joined its lawfare machine to dismantle national security defenses against Islamic terrorism. In 2008, she posted about wearing orange at the Today Show in solidarity with Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and other terrorists being held at Gitmo. She has ridiculed the idea that calling for the destruction of Israel was threatening and co-signed a petition claiming that a lawsuit by Jewish students was threatening the speech of a Berkeley Muslim Student Association. So in other words, this radical, and her record is incredibly radical, is now deputy counsel to Vice President Harris. But don't worry, she's also appointing liaisons to the Jewish community. For example, she has now appointed a person named Elon Goldberg, her liaison to the Jewish community. What do we know about Elon Goldberg? We know that he's a J Street anti-Israel radical. He supported the Obama abstention of the anti-Israel Security Council Resolution 2334 which basically suggested that the old city of Jerusalem does not belong to Israel, including the Western Wall, the Kotel, and the Temple Mount. David Milstein reporting this, a former staffer for Ron DeSantis and, uh, and David Friedman, as well as Ted Cruz. Elon, Goldenberg, Elon Goldberg opposed the Trump administration's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, and moving the embassy to Jerusalem is consistent with U.S. law and said that if these actions were taken, the U.S. should also unilaterally, unilaterally recognize a Palestinian state, opposed the U.S. recognition of Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, supported the disastrous Iran deal, opposed the Taylor Force Act, which is simply an act saying that no party can be paid that has facilitated terrorism and the murder of American citizens, supported restoring funding to the UNRWA, supported reopening the PLO mission in D.C. that was closed because the PA has been supporting the ICC. Worked in the Biden-Harris administration to implement some of the most anti-Israel policies in American history, including some of the sanctions on various groups in Israel. So that is the new liaison from Kamala Harris to the Jewish community. And yet she's going to pose as some sort of moderate. Obviously, the Democrats need the media. Without the media, they're nothing. Without them, they're nothing. And to be fair, Without the Democrats, the media are probably nothing since it is the Democrats who give them special access. Alrighty, folks, coming up, Nate Silver, pollster extraordinaire, analyst extraordinaire, and author of the brand new book, On the Edge, The Art of Risking Everything is on. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us. Republicans are Nazis. You cannot separate yourselves from the bad white people. Growing up, I never thought much about race. It never really seemed to matter that much, at least not to me. Am I? Racist. I would really appreciate it if you love. I'm trying to learn. I'm on this journey. If I'm going to sort this out. I need to go deeper undercover. They gonna say I'm racist. Joining us now is Matt, certified DEI expert. Here's my certification. And what you're doing is you're stretching out of your whiteness. This is more for you and less for you. Is America inherently racist? The word inherent is challenging there. I want to rename the George Washington Monument to the George Floyd Monument. Racist. America is racist to its bones. The, so inherently. Yes. Yeah, this country is a piece of shit. White folks, white trash, white supremacy, white woman, white boy. Is there a black person around? What's a black person right here? Does he not exist? Hi, Robin. Hi. What's your name? I'm Matt. I just had to ask who you are because you have to be careful. <laughs> Never be too careful. They gonna say you In theaters, September 13th, rated PG-13.